So thank you everybody uh, for joining me today. Thank you, Keith, for having me. I'm a complex disease navigator and COPD program coordinator. I have started up a program in Wisconsin based on patients' social determinants of health and needs and reduced readmissions by 7% in three years. Uh, currently, I am a program coordinator um, for a hospital in North Carolina for a joint commission. And today I will be talking to you about developing a COPD program based on the pillars of the Joint Commission and the COPD Gold Guidelines, and how we can put this into practice with and without having a program. I am hopeful that you will take away how to really explain to patients that COPD isn't just a diagnosis, but it's a whole lifestyle change. And I hope to help equip many healthcare providers to educate the patients, but empower them to improve their quality of life. The objective for this presentation is how to create a COPD disease specific program how to talk to patients about smoking sensation, even if they think that they can't do it. We talk about maintenance therapy, recommendations, and inhaler techniques, the benefits of pulmonary rehab, and the importance of self-management, and so much more. We will also talk about how to get involved if you already formally have a program and you are looking into getting Joint Commission certified. We'll talk about who to get involved. And we're gonna talk about an example of how to evaluate for improvement using the ACT plan, do, and study method. I hope when you leave here, you'll have a better understanding of how we can assist this patient population, not only with medication therapy at the bedside, but also how to empower them to create these lifestyle changes to promote lasting results. So what is the disease specific certification? This is a voluntary review that looks into the care provided to a defined patient population. So in this case, it would be COPD, but it's offered to many different disease processes. Joint Commission evaluates the disease management and they use the chronic care model. So this assesses program management, um, clinical information management, and also uh, looks into the process of how the care is being delivered and um, facilitating the care, and also looks into how are we supporting this self-management? How are we encouraging patients to take care of themselves on their own at home or caregivers? And then looking at the process of measuring and improving. So how is this information being taken back, looked at, and then um, worked on for process improvement? If you currently have a standard of care and education practice for this population, so if you have a COPD program or a pulmonary navigator position, which we'll talk about later, then I encourage you to reach out to Joint Commission for their certification because they really can help you level up the program and um, it looks really well for the hospital having that extra certification. The certification is renewed every two years and they will undergo a whole renewal process. Understanding the health burden of COPD. So what is the public health burden and how does it affect our community and organizations? Um, in order to really look into and create a program, we need to know where our patients come from. So first of all, COPD is the third leading cause of death globally. However, congestive heart failure is the first leading cause of death in the world. But when your lungs struggle to bring in that oxygen, this will increase the strain on the heart. So there is really a larger correlation between the two than we really think about. Um, so making the, the fact that 
it's the third leading, leading cause of death in the world, it kind of makes it a little bit misleading because we know that congestive heart failure can be developed from having COPD as well. The total economic cost is over $50 billion each year in the US, and it's projected to increase in the next 20 years, especially with the unforeseen health effects of vaping. You know, we know that vaping is geared towards a youthful generation, and we I think we're going to be seeing these numbers really and climb really climb up in the next uh, ten even ten years since vaping has been around for almost two decades now. It is um, about twenty nine point five billion dollar cost for the health system, and it is estimated that about. 700,000 hospitalizations occur nationally each year. One in every five are readmitted within 30 days of discharge with all cause readmission. And this is for any reason. So if you have a patient who was in the hospital with COPD, they leave and they end up coming back with toe pain, that counts against your hospital and you will get lower reimbursement. And the national cost of readmissions is approximately 9,000 to 12,000, but really can be any upwards of $20,000. And so that is how much it can cost that patient um, to be in the hospital, but we know that the hospital eats that cost. So it's pretty significant. Social determinants of health. So who is our patient population? How did they get to be that high utilizer or that frequent flyer, which you've probably heard or referred to patients as? First, to understand our patient demographic, we really must learn about social determinants of health. The social determinants of health are conditions in which people are born. So think of the race, the ethnicity, their social economic standings, how they grew up, so that's your living conditions, your access to healthcare, your views about healthcare. So if your friends or family had a bad experience, um, they might not have strong views about healthcare, delaying their care, and then work, what they did for a living. So the lower education means that they're, they'll have an increased likelihood of being in high exposure jobs. So that would be your chemicals, your dust, um, construction, um, all sorts of different things that can cause lung damage. And um, those who have two or more social determinants of health are likely to have multiple comorbidities. If you look at the figure, um, the Truth Initiative looked at the highest level of education and tobacco use. So you can see that no diploma and having your GED are the two highest areas that you can see tobacco use in. So this was not always the case. We'll get to that in a second, but historically speaking, neighborhoods with lower income have had more tobacco marketing for decades. This would include pricing, so they would have more discounts in these uh, lower, uh, lower income neighborhoods. The placement, they did a study um, of 30 different cities and found that 63% of schools we're only within 1,000 feet from a tobacco retailer, and this is intentional. They also offer more promotion in these areas and the product availability increases. An outstanding three out of four, or 72% of smokers, are from low-income communities. So remember, this wasn't always the case, in fact, the smoking rate was higher among those who had more wealth and education in the 1940s before the health effects of smoking became widely known and before the industry started targeting low-income individuals and larger marketing budgets. So um, in 1964 was when the, sur the first um, Surgeon General report came out. So that was when they really started to link smoking to negative health effects, but smoking we know was originally you know, thought of as, as a good thing. It was um, something to help cure asthma. It was endorsed by doctors and celebrities. So it's interesting that now there's a new population that they're marketing to, and you know, it's 
because they have less education, less understanding of the healthcare system and, and how everything correlates with each other. So knowing this information can give you a better understanding of how to approach the upcoming information in this PowerPoint. Um, it's gonna help you to be able to talk to your patients better, understand why they have problems with medication adherence and self-management, and hopefully um, help you guys to have those conversations with the patients a little bit easier and understand where they're coming from. So in today's healthcare environment, it challenges hospitals and healthcare professionals to provide high quality cost effective care and to continuously improve. So the benefits of having a standardized program will provide a reduction of unwanted variations of care. The data collected can be used to review for process improvement. The reduction or the re the reduction of treatment costs, so we can reallocate re resources to areas that need it. Um, for example, if you have high readmissions in one county, perhaps offering education or you know maybe investing in a mobile unit that can give patients that information or workups or or um, access to healthcare in those. Um, high readmission areas to hopefully stop admissions altogether and slow the progression and get people what they need a lot sooner before you know, we just let COPD take over. And then improve patient experience. So make them feel heard and tended to. The goal is to not only fix them right now while they're in the hospital, being in the hospital, we think about giving them breathing treatments and um, and steroids and um, you know ventilators and non-invasive ventilators, but we want to also think about how we can help them in the future. So I think when people get that information, they really become empowered and their experience with their whole hospital stay, not just being focused on now, but what comes next is really important. And it's also going to improve efficiency. So that's going to be your decrease of length of stay and your efficiency. So your um, uh, reduction in readmissions, um, or your, I'm sorry, your effectiveness, your reduction in readmissions, um, currently the national average is about one in every four that get readmitted within 30 days. And, which is pretty significant, especially if you're a larger hospital. And then um, decreased mortality. So that's your unexpected deaths and your deaths, your deaths without hospice. But overall, um, having a program or really looking into um, you know, how we can monitor what we're currently doing really helps to align the communication and collaboration among all disciplines. The global initiative for uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or the gold guidelines is the preferred evidence-based practice by Joint Commission. So in the next couple of slides, we're going to go into what are the gold guidelines and how can we create our program to be um, you know, based off of those gold guidelines. So the gold guidelines objectives are directed towards uh, relieving and reducing the impact of symptoms and reducing the risk of future exposures or future exacerbations. Their model emphasizes the need for education, prevention, and management. Their criteria for diagnosing is firmly based off of getting a pulmonary function test, or um, you know, specifically, uh, you can even do it in the hospital. So it doesn't need to be an outpatient pulmonary function test, but um, even a bedside spirometry, but it just needs to be post-bronchodilator um, therapy. So we're looking for the FEV1 and FEC to be less than 70%. This is mandatory to establish the diagnosis. So a lot of times we see that COPD is added to patients' profiles. They've never had any sort of pulmonary function test or even bedside spirometry, but maybe they had shortness of breath. And shortness of breath can be from lots of different reasons. So we want to make sure that we confirm that diagnosis with a pulmonary function test, not, a, um, not just a CT, not just based off of what a person is feeling, but um, we want to get that concrete data. 
In 2023, they came out with new COPD assessment tool. So previously, they had the um, A, uh, the A, B, C, and D um, in that area, and now they have the A, B, and E. So the E stands for the exacerbation. Um, and this assessment tool takes into account their spirometry. So that's your spirometry with the confirmed diagnosis. And then that grades the obstruction and then their history of exacerbations and hospitalizations. So how many times have they been in the doctor's office with an exacerbation? How many times have they been in the hospital? As well as their symptoms and their limitations that they experience using um, the two um, screening processes, which is the MMRC and the um, CAT score. Because there is a weak correlation between the severity of airflow obstruction and the symptoms experienced by the patient, the GOLD guidelines requires evaluation of how the patient feels their symptoms are in response with their treatment or even just on their own. Um, a lot of times the MMRC or the CAT score are both used after a person starts treatment to make sure that they are actually seeing benefit from that. My preferred questionnaire is the CAT score because it will trigger things for me to talk with the patient about. Um, this CAT score was developed to address the COPD burden in the everyday life. So I'm gonna give you a couple examples how I would talk with a patient. Um, so I would give them uh, these choices. I would say, I never cough is a zero. Um, I cough all the time as a five. Would you rate that for me? And the patient would say, I cough a four. So that might trigger me to say, okay, you cough quite a bit. Do they need a flutter? Should we, you know, or do they have mucus in their chest? Do I need to uh, help them, you know, get the stuff out? Do they need to learn about huff cough? I have no phlegm or mucus in my chest at all is a zero and my chest is completely full of phlegm and mucus. So this might trigger me to say, um, you know, how long has that been going on? Do they need to have a vest? You know, again, we're trying to look at not only what they're in the hospital with, but how were they feeling at baseline? How can I help them in the future? So um, do they need a vest system? Uh, the next one is my chest does not feel tight at all, um, is a zero, and my chest feels very tight, uh, is a five. And so that might trigger, are they taking their um, bronchodilator correctly? Are they on maintenance therapy? Maybe their maintenance therapy isn't cutting it. Maybe we need to try something different. If your, um, your chest is tight, do they understand about triggers? What triggers the tightness of the bronchioles and the lungs? Um, and then the next one, when I walk up a hill or a flight of stairs, um, I am not breathless, or I'm, you know, when I walk up a hill or a flight of stairs, I'm very breathless. So this maybe you would talk about pulmonary rehab. How long has that been going on? Are you active? With COPD, we want to make sure that patients are getting up and being mobile, and we want to prevent pneumonia, we want to prevent deconditioning, so pulmonary rehab would be a great choice. Um, or even online. So there's pulmonary rehab that you can go into a facility, or if you're in a more rural area, maybe there's things that you can do online, or can you just give them exercises, or maybe they need to work with PT. So lots of things to talk about with that one. I am not limited to doing activities at home, or I am very limited to doing activities at home. So why? Why would they be limited to doing things at home? Are they feeling that shortness of breath, which goes into, are they taking their medication correctly? Um, maybe they just are fearful. They have anxiety. Can we get them stuff for anxiety? Maybe they want more of a community. Maybe they feel left out. I'm not confident leaving my home despite my lung condition. Or I am, I am confident leaving my home despite my lung condition, or I'm not confident at all leaving my home because of my lung condition. So that kind of goes into the um, question before, you know, why are they not confident leaving their home? Is it because they're not as active and their fear of shortness of breath? Maybe they need a different oxygen tank. Maybe they don't want to. Um, maybe they have a fear of running out. Can we switch them over to a concentrator or, you know, talk to that patient about switching themselves over to a concentrator by talking to their DME company? And then um, I sleep soundly or I don't sleep soundly at all because of my lung condition. So that one, um, maybe they have undiagnosed sleep apnea, or maybe they have obesity hypoventilation. Why are they not sleeping comfortably? 
Do they notice that they're more short of breath when they lay flat? Do they have congestive heart failure? We know that that um, causes a person to retain a lot of fluid. Um, so looking at what would be the reasons for their sleep. So I, I really like to use the um, CAP score because it really does do a good job and having those conversations and just triggering you different things to talk about. The MMRC score is more of your um, dyspnea scale for patients and they would grade their level of, short, of that shortness of breath. Um, the higher the score of the CAT score impacts the patient's uh, life. So it goes from zero to 40. So the higher the score, the more profound their COPD is. Um, the more it affects or impacts their life. And then um, the way that you can know or the way that the patient can know that if they're stable versus they're in an exacerbation is that that number uh, that when, they, when, we, when we rate them, that number would be different or increased by about five. Uh, so supporting prevention and maintenance therapy. Coaching patients through smoking cessation is the first step to managing COPD. Um, approximately 40% of people continue to smoke, which to me sounds like a low number, but 40 people continue to smoke after they have the diagnosis of COPD. The average person has to try and fail quitting about seven times before they are successful. So we know, and I'm sure the patient knows, um, as the secrets behind uh, smoking is no longer secret anymore, we know all the damage that it, does, that, that it does. So we all know that quitting improves health and reduces COPD exacerbations, overall increase, increasing life expectancy. It lowers the risk of cancer, it slows progression and reduces the loss of lung function over time. It reduces respiratory symptoms such as cough, sputum, wheezing, and overall shortness of breath. So if the patient knows all that, why is it so hard for them to quit? Nicotine causes a chain reaction that releases three chemicals into the body, and that makes, the pe makes people feel rewarded. It boosts alertness, and it makes them feel happy. So, you know, how can you really compete with that? Well, <clears throat> we need to try to assist the patient, even if you've heard several times, I've tried quitting, I failed, or, you know, I just can't do it, or I don't know who I am without it. I actually had a patient um, recently who started smoking when they were five years old, and he was 36 years old, and he already had stage four COPD, and he says, I don't know what I would do without smoking. I don't know who I am. He picked it up from seeing his father do it. But talking to them and having them understand that, yeah, you probably can't do it on your own, but there's things out there that can work for you. And understanding a little bit of the science and information behind it can help them look at it differently. So addiction is 20% physical and 80% uh, psychological. Encourage them to address that physical dependence first. So that's your withdrawal symptoms. And this can be addressed with nicotine replacement therapy. The most uh, crucial time period is about two to three weeks after a person quits. And nicotine replacement therapy gives a steady release of that nicotine to curb those withdrawals and manage those cravings. So that way they can create new life patterns. Uh, the three chemicals that are released in the body are dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin. So now the body has been trained to expect to have that nicotine, and so they are going to start experiencing the lack of drive or will, um, lack of enjoyment. The norepinephrine is going to cause the uh, fogginess, uh, poor attention, poor concentration, poor productivity, and then the low serotonin, so poor emotions, the lack of peacefulness and just being agitated and kind of moody. Um, so nobody wants to experience that, experience that. Even your spouse, you know, their spouse isn't going to want to experience that if they don't smoke. Um, more likely to influence the person to, you know, maybe just pick it up because they think they're being too mean to them. Um, but once 
you're on the nicotine replacement therapy and getting that, getting that controlled amount of nicotine, that will lessen those side effects and it'll help them to focus on the 80%, which is the uh, psychological. So the psychological addiction is more complex and that's really due to the relationship between smoking and feelings. People often smoke because they feel stressful, they feel anxious, they feel sad, and they have now trained their body to expect the release of all of those happy endorphins and artificially reward themselves. So we have to train the body to get over that, train the head to get over that. So addressing the physical addiction is something that can go on for many, many years, but the crucial period is about three to 12 months. Um, but really, again, it can just trigger at any time and they will go right back to smoking the way that they were before. So new pathways to trigger uh, need to be created. For example, imagine a field of grass and every day you take the same path. That path will become worn and that path is now built into your habit. Your body just naturally leads that way, knows where to go. Now imagine you take a new path and the grass barely moves and you really have to think about how am I not gonna get lost? <laughs> it's a lot of work. So any signs of slipping, your feet will take you right back to where you left off. It'll go with the past of least resistance. So maybe try to use that analogy with patients and just have them stick to it because every day that they make different choices, they are going to be able to carve into that path a little bit more and a little bit more and every day it'll become easier. So the more healthy alternatives to smoking to help deal with finding or help deal with a feeling, the more natural it becomes and less triggering to smoking. Counseling helps to provide the patients with the tools to have and to have with alternative ways um, so they can navigate through those triggers and even identify triggers that maybe they didn't even know they had. So they've been doing it for so long, they didn't even know that that was something that made them want to smoke. Other um, alternative methods would be acupuncture, um, using pressure points of the ear. Um, these all release endorphins to help crave the nicotine. Uh, surges, um, exercise releases natural endorphins, which is a great thing, learning new things. So learning maybe a language or maybe learning how to crochet or maybe getting involved in making puzzles and then going cold turkey. Um, so some of you have probably heard your patients say, I went cold turkey, I did that for three months and then they ended up going right back to it. Or maybe you've tried it. And um, the unfortunate thing is it's only about 5% uh, effective. So Still effective, I guess it can happen, but it's going to be less likely. One of the things you're going to want to do is just really look into or have those um, conversations about the nicotine replacement therapy in combination with the counseling. So supporting prevention and maintenance therapy. Medication adherence. Um, those who have used long-acting bronchodilators compared to placebos have shown to have a slowed decline of their FEV1 by about 5 mLs per year. And the use of a cortical steroid declined the, uh, delayed the uh, decline of the FEV1 of about 7.3 mLs a year. So that's pretty significant. But what's really interesting is that most people don't even understand how to use their medication. So there was a study done on about 175 patients and there was a total of 192 inhalers and only 2.80, I'm sorry, 2.8% of those patients took their medication correctly. That is huge. Out of 175 patients, only less than 3% of those patients took that medication correctly. So we really need to review the inhaler technique every single hospitalization, every single visit. When you go in and give inhalers, let's review. We cannot do that enough. 
and we need to ensure that the patient has access to a spacer. So one of the things I found was very interesting is when you use a spacer, you actually get about 70% more of the medication into the lungs, and that's because of people's um, improper inhaler technique. The picture shows clear recommendations on medications uh, based on the bedside spirometer. So you could do the bedside or a full PFT. Um, you can do the bedside at discharge, even if they are in the hospital with a COPD exacerbation. I don't typically do it with pneumonia um, unless the antibiotic has completed. But there has been a study done in North Carolina that uh, using a bedside spirometry the day of discharge using a PFT outpatient, it's really not gonna change by much. Um, and then assess the CAT score. So again, looking at how the patient perceives that their symptoms are, and then how many times have they been in the hospital uh, within the 12 months. And so this has been new as of 2023, and these are all accumulative. So if you are uh, group A, you're gonna have a bronchodilator. So now all of a sudden, maybe your CAT score is increased and you're having more symptoms, we would do your LABA plus your LAMA, and that would be with your bronchodilator. So they would still be taking that albuterol medication every four to six hours as needed. And then if they still come back into the hospital or as CUPD progresses, we would have your lava lama, and then we would consider the ICS if your blood eosinophils was greater than 300, and then they would still have their bronchodilator. Pulmonary rehab. This is a great thing to offer and to have conversations with patients at any age and any stage of COPD. Pulmonary rehab is a great way to offer the patient's community. A lot of times people have anxiety and depression, so this offers community to let them know they're not alone. It increases their physical ability. So naturally, when a patient is short of breath, they don't wanna do something that makes them short of breath, so they start to slow down. And we know that a body in motion stays in motion, so super important to get the person physically active. Pulmonary rehab tailors the program based off of what the patient's current capabilities are. Um, they look at the comorbidities, so what else is happening, and they overall ask them, what are your goals? They do this through a full patient assessment, and the optimal benefits are achieved within about six to eight weeks when doing it twice weekly. But insurance, unfortunately, they limit people how many times they can go into pulmonary rehab. So typically insurance covers about 72 sessions per lifetime, but it depends on the insurance. Um, it also depends on the facility. So if they maybe offer pulmonary rehab uh, three times a week, maybe they would see those results a little bit sooner. So you'd really have to talk to your pulmonary rehab in your area um, or in your hospital. Uh, what they do there is they focus on the exercising, but really they increase in the endurance through that exercise, but they focus on breathing retraining, which is, um, like if you think about getting up from a chair, if you notice a patient and maybe they're struggling, they're short of breath, and you watch them get up to go to the bathroom, they typically hold their breath. Think about bending over when they go to tie their shoe, they hold their breath. So what breathing retraining is, is they teach them how to breathe through that exertion. So typically you're gonna take a big deep breath in, big cleansing breath, and when they exert, they will exhale. So basically retraining them how to breathe through it by taking that cleansing breath first instead of holding their breath. If they hold their breath, then their body is like, whoa, I'm just holding my breath now. I worked so hard for that breath. They get short of breath, they get anxiety, they chew through their oxygen, their heart rate goes up, um, especially, you know, maybe they have heart failure as well. So all those things happen and then the person wants to limit what they're doing. So they retrain how a patient is breathing. And pulmonary rehab has been shown to be the most effective therapeutic strategy to improve shortness of breath, um, health status, and exercise tolerance. 
It's also going to help to reduce readmissions and future hospitalizations. I like to get my patients enrolled into the uh, pulmonary rehab program right after they leave the hospital so I can get them to have more eyes on them so they're not ending up back in the hospital. If they can help to learn what those triggers are that they have, that they're even having a COPD exacerbation, what it looks like, and if I can give them that community, the less likely they're going to be back into my hospital. And then um, it reduces the symptoms of anxiety and depression. Education and self-management. So patients often get diagnosed with COPD and they do not understand their diagnosis or their treatment. Um, it's very unfortunate that when you go into a doctor's office, I'm sure everybody here has experienced it, but you are in and out of those offices so quickly. And that's just how it is nowadays. So we need to take this information and empower the patient at the bedside because we see them several times a day. So keep this in mind when you are seeing the patients, but it takes an average person to hear something seven times before committing it to memory. That's pretty much, that's a lot. Um, when I go into a patient room, I really, when I leave and I give them all this information, I only expect that they're going to remember about 20%. But if nurses are doing it, if respiratory is doing it, if pulmonary rehab is doing it, if I'm doing it again, when they come back into the hospital, they are going to commit more of this stuff to memory. Uh, studies have shown that out of 426 discharges, only half of the patients understood their disease condition, and only 7% of them actually understood their medication and discharge instructions. That really doesn't surprise me that only 7% understood their medication and discharge instructions because people tend to information overload people when they see that they're going to be going um, to discharge home. Uh, so making sure that we're giving this information little bits every single time that we're seeing them and having those conversations, and especially with your frequent flyers, because um, you know they'll be back and you know we can still reinforce all that information. In 2003, the U.S. Department of Education conducted a, a national assessment of health literacy skills and found that only that found that only 36 percent. Um, I found that 36% had serious limitations to health literacy. So there's four components to health literacy that influences a person's ability to understand. So if you think about how they grew up, so their race, their ethnicity, their um, geographical area, their social status, their exposure, kind of goes back into that social determinants of health that we talked about earlier. Um, also, you know, the printed health literacy. So that's like you're reading and you're writing. So people who maybe don't read and write, um, I've experienced that quite often. And when I address the reading and writing and I give them videos about COPD, I pull them up on my phone and I give them to them while I'm giving them a breathing treatment so they can look at this and watch it. And they tend to learn better from that. Um, I always call that a win because you know I've discovered that they can't read or write and all the information they've been given for many years has, you know, they're embarrassed and they don't want to tell you, but it's been information that hasn't been absorbed. And then oral health literacy. So are they listening? Maybe they don't have very good listening skills um, and then how they speak. So making sure that the information is in the right language. And then um, numeracy. So understanding the clinical and public health data. So are they actually understanding the information that they're receiving? Are they understanding? Are we using simple words, um, avoiding the medical jargon? So um, think back to that social determinants of health slide. Uh, we need to understand the root cause of their limitations um, on the self-management factors. So we know people don't want to be in the hospital. We know that people, at least most don't, um, we know that people don't want to be unhealthy. So looking at and asking them questions and getting to know them, do they not attend their appointments maybe because they need transportation? Are they not taking their medication because maybe they can't afford it? 
or are they not understanding how to take it? So maybe they've been taking it wrong. Um, this is their access, you know, what is their access to healthcare? Um, maybe they don't understand how to get a primary doctor. So if nobody showed you how to get a doctor, maybe they just don't know how and they keep utilizing the ER. But every time you have an interaction with them, just reinforce those little bits of information at a time. Uh, personalize every patient's education and training. You don't want to go in there with a whole spiel every time or say the same thing every time to everyone. Um, only discuss things that they will find that's useful. So again, that goes back to really doing that first patient interview and asking them questions. Let them get to know you. You get to know them. What is their background? We can really find a lot about them. And uh, we don't need to talk about everything. So if they have awesome inhaler technique and they know how to use a spacer, don't talk about it. If they don't smoke, skip it. If they have stage one COP and are in the hospital for toe pain, but you just happen to see them because maybe they were feeling short of breath, they probably don't need pulmonary rehab right now. We want to keep it pertinent. Uh, ideas that you can talk about, of course, are the smoking sensation, the inhaler technique. What are they currently taking for inhalers? Um, early recognitions of those exacerbations, uh, decisions. So helping them understand you know, what actions to take. So decision-making, um, you know, when is it important to see somebody? So when, to see, when do I need to be seen for help? And um, medication adherence. Are they being able to afford their medication? Can we print off a coupon for them? Um, maybe they need to talk to their primary doctor. Maybe we need to send a message to the hospitalist and just say, this patient can't afford this medication. Can we get it switched at discharge? and then provide an incentive spirometer. So an incentive spirometer, we know that everybody gets one at some point or another in their life. And when I bring this out, I like to put a new spin on it. So if you think about the process of using an incentive spirometer, they're inhaling in that little ball or that line, or that bar is going up. What it's doing is seeing how much air the person can fit into their lungs, how much volume they're getting into their lungs. So in simple terms, if they're having an exacerbation, if they were around somebody who had lots of perfume and that was super irritating to their lungs, they're coughing, they're wheezing, or maybe they're not, but maybe they did experience something. And when you inhale, they're not going to be able to fit as much volume into that incentive spirometer because the bronchioles are going to be inflamed. They're going to be um, swollen you're not going to be able to fit as much air into that swollen straw than you would if that straw was nice and open so trying to explain it to them like that as a first visualize um, it's a first tool that they can use that they can actually see because we know that and i do this and i'm sure everybody else does this i'm not alone but we make excuses for ourselves when we don't feel well maybe i ate too much so I'm a little short of breath, or maybe I am getting a cold, or you know, we make excuses because people don't want to be sick, but then they wait too long to go in to see a provider or to tell them that they need help or um, to take their breathing treatment that they have for when they need it. So using a, an incentive spirometer is something that helps them to quantify that. Oh, I used to get a thousand, now I'm only getting 750. Why? Um, so again, the goal is to inspire self-management. Uh, we are just providing the different tools so they can do this. Some facilities are fortunate to have a pulmonary navigator. Uh, this is someone who can provide navigation through their journey and offer continuity of care during their hospitalization. Um, it's a really great program, and um, I'm hoping that if your hospital doesn't have it, that maybe this will inspire you to have that conversation or try to become this in a little part uh, for your patients. So what do they do? They advocate for the patients, and they bridge those care gaps of that social determinants of health. So again, back to that slide in the beginning, where did they come from? What do they know? How can we help them? 
Um, do they have access to rides? All of those things. Um, and then uh, connecting patients with services to ensure that they have a holistic approach. So are, is there people in the community? I had a patient not want to leave her home because she's so short of breath. She wanted to take a wheelchair, but she didn't have a ramp. So being able to get them in contact with somebody with a church that could build a ramp. Um, and then assist with medications, understanding, appointments, transportations, and um, communication, encouraging communication with the primary care doctor, and then offering the patient information on self-care. Results of having a pulmonary navigator can be phenomenal. Although there has not been a significant amount of studies on the impact of the pulmonary navigator, there is not really a standardized program because different hospitals have different resources in the community and different resources within the facility itself. But they have been found to decrease readmissions, increase patient compliance, increase outpatient visits, so getting them to the doctor and when they need to be seen by the doctor instead of using the ER. Um, that brings me to our next one, decreases the ER visits. And best of all, gives the patient hope and encouragement that what is happening is not set in stone. What we can do, you know, retraining the body and understanding what causes the exacerbation to help them slow the progression, a pulmonary navigator would be a great program coordinator for the Joint Commission program as well. Um, I do know that Chandler Jones has a CEU around this um, uh, pulmonary navigator position, and that would be a great resource if you are looking for more information about that. So best practices when establishing a hospital-based program. We talked about all the things that we can do for our patients to reduce readmissions and how we can improve them. So in summary, we want to make sure we're educating them. So starting off with that CAT assessment, this will let them know, um, this will let, let us know what to talk to them about, kind of give us a place to start, give them a COPD action plan. So that is what is here. There's many different versions of this. Um, this one's from the American Lung Association, and it is a really great tool to help them look at what their signs and symptoms are, and then when and what to do, so encouraging them to talk to their doctor about it. Medication reconciliation. This can be done um, by a pharmacist or a pharmacy technician, uh, but they go over, or even us, um, they go over how to take their medications, uh, when to take it, uh, when they need to take their bronchodilator, why they need to take it, and then how is you know, their technique. Advanced care planning, which I did not talk about yet, but this is really important too. Any patient with a chronic disease will benefit from palliative care, whether this is a friendly conversation, differentiating palliative care and hospice. So a lot of times you'll hear, oh no, that's hospice, and I don't wanna get involved in that. This is gonna to help to break down those barriers and eliminate fear because palliative care is not hospice. And then goals of, um, you know, what are their goals? And just to help them figure out, maybe they need to get a healthcare dire um, directive. And then discharge instructions. So. Patients get a lot of discharge instructions, and we want to make sure that that information is pertinent to what they're going to do. Um, so including maybe the COPD action plan and um, not, not just overloading all the, the printouts we can attach to their ABS. And then timely follow-ups. Um, patients would benefit from having appointments within 10 days, so within 10 days, not after 10 days, um, of discharge, and then making sure that they have the proper referrals. So do they need to see a pulmonary, pulmonary clinic? Um, outpatient spirometry, maybe you weren't able to do it in the hospital. Uh, do they need outpatient smoking cessation treatment center options or maybe a pulmonary referral uh, for rehab? Oops. So to um, put together a COPD program team, um, you have your program manager or coordinator, so that could be, you know, a respiratory therapist. I'm a strong proponent in keeping this in the respiratory lane. Um, and then, or, you know, a pulmonary disease navigator. 
And then you have your physician champion. Uh, we need to get uh, an RN, uh, nursing manager involved, case management, palliative care, and pharmacy. And then how to design a successful disease management program. So in summary, too, to kind of break this down a little bit, I'm gonna running a little low on time, um, but we want to keep the program size, try to, keep, try to keep it larger. Having a larger program size will allow you to refine the process, um, reviewing that data, make it simple. We want to have people buy in. We wanna make it as easy as possible for people to follow. And then um, keep it patient focused. Again, it is about your patient. Um, you wanna make sure you're only presenting information to them that they need. Um, and then easy data collection. So we need to make sure that we are analyzing our data, our information, our results right away so we can actively problem solve for those. Um, and then uh, the 30-day all-cause uh, readmission review. So this is an example of how to do the um, act, plan, do, study, and do, um, or do and study. But this is an example of one that I had put together. So my goal for a COPD program would be to fall below the national standards, which I, which I believe is, um, I don't have it written down, but I think it's 20 or 22% around there. So when you have your action, you want to think about what are you trying to accomplish? And then your plan, how are you going to get that accomplished? Who do you need? Who are your stakeholders? Who do you need to get involved? Your do would be, what do I actually need to do for this? Um, how do I present this information to my patients? Or how do I present it to the hospital um, to get results and then study the results? So again, easy data collection, making sure we're looking at that information um, as we get it.